Hello, hello, and welcome back to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. We do this show most of the time, every two weeks, and we talk about anything that we feel like where the Fab Four are concerned. Their years together, the solo years, songs, albums, history, what's going on in the news, you name it, we cover it all here on Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. And I do hope you're aware of my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. Everyone except Darren has listened to the show, <laughs> Every Little Thing. Um, and I also co-host another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, also bi-weekly. That's with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. And in addition to that, I have my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is all loaded with Beatles content. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts on this show. First of all, a man who has written a number of books on the group, including Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and also The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and most recently, The Beatles, I'm sorry, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. And Volume 1 usually leads to Volumes 2, 3, I know for a fact this is going to go for like nine volumes altogether. But volume two will be coming out, we hope, still. It's December 10th is the release date for that. Along with Adrian Sinclair putting together the best McCartney uh, biography. And that's uh, our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, Darren. And hello, everyone out there. Okay. As you can tell, Alan is a maniac which either means he loves the state or he loves the movie Flashdance. It's one or the other. I can't make up my mind which which one it is. And Darren DeVivo is with <laughs> us. You know, Darren, for uh, <laughs> being on New York radio for over 40 years on uh, New York's WFUV. And he is uh, full-time there. And also you can hear him on the weekends and... He's been doing wonderful interviews and lots of great programming, and he's been part of our show for many years now. Hi, Darren. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new show. This time out, we're going to be discussing this brand new DVD, which came out called Revival 69. And it's all about the Live Peace in Toronto concert, or that's better known as the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. Was that what it was called? Yep. And uh, lots of incredible can, people were there. Yeah. Sure. As you can see, I got a backwards copy. <laughs> John would love that. <laughs> particular. John and Yoko. And all, all the Beatles would like that. Anyway, um, so we'll be talking about that in detail. And uh, But first, as we normally do, we have the latest in Beatle news to get to. A lot has happened in the last couple of weeks. First of all, John Lennon's Mind Games, The Meditation Mixes, will in fact be coming out now on ultra-clear vinyl enclosed in a mirrorboard gatefold. It will also be available for streaming. The release date for that is October the 11th, and you can actually pre-order it now. So previous to this, it was only available to get as an app, was it? Yes, right? Okay. Yeah. If you'd rather yeah. have, have it on vinyl or just to listen to it digitally, that's the way to do it. October 11th for the date for that. Now, John and Yoko's documentary called Daytime Revolution chronicles a week in February 1972 when John and Yoko co-hosted the Mike Douglas show. And it seems to be a time right now when many Beatles and solo releases are going to show up in movie theaters. And that is the case with Daytime Revolution, which will be on the big screen in more than 50 theaters, they say, in the U.S. on John's birthday, October the 9th. Originally, the documentary was planned for the fall of 2022, but a decision was made to hold it back to come closer to the election fall of 2024. Director Eric Nelson says, we felt very strongly that the film's optimistic and idealistic message would be a far more welcome letter from home the closer we got to what promised to be an apocalyptic and tension-filled November 5th. And we were clearly right in that assumption. 
There's no word yet on a, DV, uh, a DVD or a Blu-ray release for that. So if all the information that we have is correct, based on what we've been hearing the last few weeks, for theatrical releases, we'll have one hand clapping, which will be in theaters September 26th. Don't know if that'll be more than a day. It is. I believe it is. Really? Yeah, yeah I, one of the theaters up by me, I think, is showing it, I think, more than once. It's like that we, it goes into the weekend. Okay. I'm pretty sure the original, the, the first screening, the date you have. I wish I had my calendar handy. Oh, it's yeah, right here. Here, here it's showing the 26th, um, which I think is a Thursday, and the 29th, which is a Sunday. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. All right. Well, you got to figure that everyone that wants to see it is probably going to rush out, you know, fairly soon after it's in theaters. So one hand clapping starts September 26th. Daytime Revolution is October 9th. And the movie about Brian Epstein, Midas, uh, Midas Man, uh, should be in theaters October the 10th. Busy time hmm. for fans there. Now, Billboard reported some very interesting news coming from our colleague... Pierce Hemmingson, the author of the book series, The Beatles in Canada. I wonder if the two of you have heard about this. Pierce owns two reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes of the Beatles performance at the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto from August 17, 1965, directly from the soundboard. And he wants to sell it. He says only seven people have actually heard the reels, and Pierce says this is the best recording of any Beatles concert in Canada, if not North America, other than what was professionally recorded for the Beatles themselves. He says the reels contain the Beatles' entire afternoon set, the opening acts, venue announcements about upcoming events, and a press conference with the Beatles' manager, Brian Epstein, their PR person, Tony Barrow, and the BBC's Brian Matthew held at the Long Shuttered Arena's Hot Stove Lounge. In 2015, Pierce brought the tapes to the attention of the Beatles company Apple Corps, and they flew him out to Abbey Road Studios, and they played his real tapes on their studio equipment. Four people were there to listen, including Giles Martin, Jonathan Clyde, the director of production at Apple Corps, Sean McGee, mastering engineer at Abbey Road, and Lester Smith, technician and microphone custodian at Abbey Road, who set up the tape equipment and who actually just retired a week ago after uh, after working at Abbey Road for 56 years. At the time, they expressed no interest in these recordings as they were working on the Eight Days a Week documentary. But that doesn't mean they might not express an interest further on down the road. And earlier this year, some sample clips were sent to Peter Jackson for his evaluation. They say that Pierce has the right to sell these tapes, just not release them commercially. So what will happen with these tapes? Soundboard quality. That's very tempting to hear. Do you have how any much, idea how much he's expecting? Um, well, there was some talk about selling it for an auction, uh, mm -hmm. like Omega auctions, and they were saying that it could get anywhere from seventy to $100,000. Okay, I'm I was, out. Ho I was <laughs> hoping he'd take maybe fifty bucks because I can <laughs> I could call him now and if, so if so we... did I get what you said straight? Apple yeah. wasn't interested at the time. At the time, this is 2015. Wasn't interested. We're yeah, not interested in these. We're doing something out? already. But if if these clips were sent to Peter Jackson. There has to be some intent there, I would hope. <laughs> you know, should what I, can you do with these recordings? Should I, I call out to Peter? Go out. Hey, Peter, <laughs> if you're <laughs> out there watching this show, um, you know, doors always open. We can chat more. Okay. We all know that Darren has a red phone to Peter's home in uh, New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like the Batman phone. All right. More news here. This got a lot of attention. Last Tuesday night, Paul McCartney attended a concert by Chad <laughs> Smith, the drummer from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, along with producer Andrew Watts, 
who's been working with Paul on his next album, as well as the most recent Rolling Stones album, which had a track with Paul on bass. The show was held at the Stephen Talk House in Amagans at Long Island. Paul went on stage and sang Neil Young's Rockin' in the Free World with Watt's girlfriend, Charlotte Lawrence. He also sang I Saw Her Standing There, and the house band included Saturday Night Live alumni, G.E. Smith, yeah. plus a horn section. And wow. speaking of... You going to say something, Darren? No, I just said, wow. Uh, from having been to many shows at Stephen Talk House and um, the thought of, you know, accidentally bumping in, being at the show that night. Well, I wonder if there was any, any pre, if there was any vibe that he was going to show up or if it was a total surprise to those people in the audience. I'm sure it was a surprise. Certainly there was nothing in the media about it prior to the show or any buzz. Yeah. About it, so. You can find it, by the way, on YouTube. And um, if you're searching YouTube, since there are a number of clips ranging from one minute to 10 or 11 minutes, search for the one that says multicam, because that actually edits together several uh, angles and um, and is, I think, the longest running clip at least that I've found. I think that's the 11 minute one. Okay. Um, both songs too. <laughs> so. How did Paul sound with rocket in the free world in particular? I mean, that would certainly, I mean, I've heard him do. I saw her standing there a million times, but rocket in the free world. Yeah. yeah um, okay. I mean, it, it was sort of, you know, his vocal wasn't absolutely out front on that, so sort of hard to say, but um, it was a little more out front than I saw her standing there, which he, you know, he did it, he wasn't playing an instrument, he was just standing there with a, a mic, mm -hmm. and he took the opportunity to do some different phrasing in I saw her standing there because it's also a different backing than he's used to. It was, it was, it was interesting because it was, um, it was more of a, a jam than just a straight performance, you know? And so he, he phrased things differently and uh, he seemed to be having a good time. Mm. Okay. I'll have to check that out. And speaking of the red hot chili peppers, there's more. <laughs> their bass player flea was a guest on the ted danson woody harrelson podcast did you know the two of them do a podcast um and it's called where everybody knows your name isn't that nice in mm -hmm. the interview flea referred to paul mccartney as rock's greatest bass player he's quoted as saying he's just great I mean, there are so many guys that are great in different ways, but Paul's bass playing is so lyrical and melodic, and it's just so beautiful. One of the things I've heard is that he put the bass on after. A band like mine, the bass sometimes, the song starts with bass lines. So coming, so coming first, or the music comes first. Some nice words there from Flea. Snoop Dogg did an interview with Dr. Dre, where he told of meeting Paul McCartney, who wanted a hug from him are there like 10 different camera angles on this alan when you looked online i haven't found that one actually this apparently was at uh the recent jimmy buffett tribute concert when asked if he would consider collaborating with paul snoop said yes he's one of my heroes i would absolutely go in there with him also, it's funny that that's not the uh sort of headline that i've seen there I, what i've seen is that it was mostly about how when paul turned up he was going to put his joint out <laughs> and paul said no keep it uh-huh that got well, more attention than anything else huh <laughs> that that i think was the main thing <laughs> okay <laughs> the home of pete best where the casbah club was built in their basement has now opened itself to an air b and b Above the club are five suites that you can now book, which officially launched on August the 21st. There is a room named for John. There's one for Paul. There's one for George. There's one for Stu Sutcliffe. And there's one for Pete. Ironically, not one for Ringo. Hmm. I thought you were going to say the garage or something. Uh... <laughs> Well, the outdoor bathroom was... I was going to say that. 
Boy, that that's a real zinger there to Ringo. Anyway, uh brand new James McCartney song is called Circle Game. This is actually a cover of the Joni Mitchell song that she first released on her album Ladies of the Canyon. Real nice version of it too. Check it out. You can find it all on all streaming services. James McCartney with Circle Game. Julian Lennon just released a single uh, that is a remix of one of his songs from the past called I Should Have Known <clears throat> from his Photograph Smile album. And uh, you can check that out as well on streaming services. Really pretty song. It's been a while since I heard it. And it's actually really beautiful melodically. And man, Julian's vocals are just spot on on that song. Don't know why he chose to redo this song with the remix, but it's there for those of you who want to check it out. The great jazz guitarist Pat Metheny has just released a new album called Moondial, in which he covers the Beatles song Here, There, and Everywhere. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for that information. I'm sure you remember that in recent years we've had tours called It Was 50 Years Ago Today, which gathers together an all-star cast of musicians that perform a concert that is half Beatles songs, half their own hits. The last one had the band covering songs from both Rubber Soul and Revolver. A new tour was just announced in which songs will be performed from both the Let It Be album and maybe this is for Darren to get Darren excited. The Hey Jude album. All right. They picked the Hey Jude album. <laughs> they must have known that this was where it all started for Darren. Yeah. yeah. The musicians include Christopher Cross, Joey Mullen, and Jason Sheff, all of whom were in the last group, which, if you recall, also had Denny Lane in there, plus Glenn Shorrock from the Little River Band and Maxie Priest. They will all make up this new band going out on the road. I've only seen one date listed so far. We'll probably hear about more soon. And that's uh, actually in Huntington, Long Island at the Paramount. That's on October the 29th. I want to mention the passing of the legendary broadcaster, Phil Donahue, at mm. the age of 88. And uh, Beatle fans will know that Ringo appeared on his show in 1981 with Barbara Bach to promote K-Man. He was also on in 1995. And that was in part to promote the All-Star Band touring at that time. That was the third All-Star Band. He appeared on the show with Max Weinberg, who was there to talk about drumming along with Ringo and why Ringo was so influential in his drumming and to the rock world. And um, it was really a fun show and a lot of good questions coming from the audience, although most of them were Beatle related. Um, you can actually find this show on YouTube. And in the audience that day was me with my future oh. wife sitting next to me and I got to ask Ringo a question on television. And actually it had to do with uh, the fact that uh, the album time takes time and come out in 1992. He hadn't released a new album since then. It wasn't until vertical man a few years later after that, but I wanted to know. And I said, I think time takes time is one of the best albums you've made. And I got a great reaction from the audience clapping along with that, which I'll bet made Ringo feel really good. Um, but yeah, if you want to check it out, towards the end of the show, I get to ask him a question. And uh, you'll find a lot of people, a Beatle crowd in their faces that you you might know. Charles Rosney, our good friend who does a lot of Beatle conventions and the Beatle trip to England um, every single year in August is there. Fred Velez, who's known for being the big Monkees fan, put out a couple of Monkees books. He's in the audience. A lot of friends of Charles's. Um Probably a lot of people you recognize in the audience there that day. A very special day and very sad to to hear about Phil, one of the pioneers in uh, at talk show uh, programs. Um, and let's close by mentioning a few birthdays here. Happy 73rd birthday last Friday to Mark Hudson. A couple of days ago, Steve Holly of Wings turned 71. And yesterday, Elvis Costello. Celebrated the big 7-0. And as I said, our show today is about this brand new DVD that came out, which covers the uh, Toronto Rock and Roll uh, Festival. 
and um, I just watched it just before <laughs> we started to tape this show, and I really enjoyed it. I think it told uh, the full story of how this this concert came about and um, how it almost didn't even get off the ground and how it was struggling from the very beginning and how the promoters, even though they had a really great lineup of musicians, primarily 50s rock and rollers, and then also Alice Cooper, and they got the Doors also to be on the bill, they still were struggling to sell tickets. And it wasn't until, um, was it Richie York? who got to, oh, Kim Fowley, I'm sorry. Kim Fowley, the um, the MC of the show, who is well known, um, along with Rodney Bingenmeyer um, in California, uh, as, as uh, big name entertainment stars, um, Kim Fowley suggested to the promoters um and they were uh get the names out here i have the names david walker and john brower was it david ken no. ken walker ken walker and john brower to uh give john lennon a call because um kim knew that john loved chuck berry and he loved little richard and he might be interested in being a part of this and this was only a few days before the show and it's a pretty incredible story with uh, many people who were a part of it. Glad to see many of them are still alive um, that took part in this documentary, including John Brower, who you see a lot, and Ken Walker. And um, I think it really told the story extremely well. Um, and, and it's actually because in the very beginning, they're talking about all the 50 stars that they got and, you know, how excited they were about it. And actually, before this concert, they had um, a pop festival in the summertime of 69, which did really well. And they wanted to have another festival to bounce off of that. So they thought of this idea and they thought of gathering together all these 50s rockers. And then they also got Alice Cooper involved and The Doors. But um, what did you guys think of the way the story was told? Because I think it was pretty complete. Um, kind of kept me going on the edge of my seat not really no i mean i obviously i knew john and yoko and the band were going to show up there but it was very possible that that might not have happened at all for a number of reasons um alan yeah um i thought it was told really well uh i i knew a lot of the details because um when we were working on volume one of McCartney legacy there it, it sort of comes into it because this is like really just a few days before John comes in and says uh I want a divorce you know and and one of the reasons he says that is because he was so energized by performing live you know with a totally different group he just suddenly wanted to do something else so we had to we had to research all that and a lot of the detail is in Anthony Fawcett's book one day at a time and anthony fawcett is in this film um and has a lot to say ab about you know how it all came together and he has tapes which he plays i, I wish he played a little more of them mm. um but tapes of the phone calls between john brower and you know in himself uh, and, you know, to get John involved. And then he has a bit of the tape of him calling back and saying, John is willing to be involved. Um, and it was, but, but what I didn't know, actually, a lot of was sort of the, the Brower and Walker side of it, you know, going to, I mean, they, they go to a, a biker to lend them some money, a lot of money. And, you know, he's sort of like as a, a sort of dangerous guy, you know, and if this didn't work out, um, they were going to be on the hook for the money and, and God knows what. So, um, you know, there's there's all of that. And they go to Chum, the big radio station in Toronto to try and get them to help promote it. And they get thrown out because they just don't believe them. I mean, I, I didn't know any of that stuff. And that was really kind of interesting. And in fact, actually, I approached this movie with 
but perhaps not the best attitude because from my point of view, I'm really just interested in the performances, you know, I mean, I just, and but the thing is that we have John's performance on tape and disc and it's been out, you know, on, on video. And uh, mm. uh, so we, we've seen it and, and heard multiple mixes of it because several of the releases are, are remixed Um and, you know, at the very beginning, you hear, I guess, Kim Fowley saying, you know, Toronto, Brower and Walker presents. And so it Get was your matches ready. Hmm? Get your matches ready. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it's it, it's good to get a, you know, a perspective on who Brower and Walker were and what yeah. they went through to put this on and how it, it didn't start out as a, as a concert you know the concert that was going to have john in it and and john's turning up basically saved it um but wrecked the beatles if you think of it that way yeah. <laughs> mm. um so yeah i mean I, I i thought it was nicely done i mean you've some of it was you know for obviously they didn't have footage of themselves from back then so they have a uh, cartoon versions of them which are really well done um, plus Klaus's drawings, you know, of them rehearsing on the plane, photos of them rehearsing on the plane. There was a lot of good stuff in it, gotta say. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, because it's a good thing you brought up Anthony Fawcett, who adds so much to this documentary here. But the whole story about um, uh, Brower and Walker going to Chum and telling them, we got John Lennon for this concert and they didn't believe him. And then they went back and got Anthony Fawcett on the phone to say, John will be there and the other members of the band will be there. And they still, that wasn't enough for them at Chum. Yeah. You know, so if yeah. it wasn't for Russ Gibb, who is mm -hmm. a, a concert promoter in Detroit. He's a DJ. Okay. They also said concert promoter in the documentary. Really? But, hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he once he, he took their word for it that that John and Yoko and the band were going to be there and he promoted it on the air in Detroit. And that's when tickets sold because only about 2000 tickets sold and that just to break even, they needed to sell nine million. They only sold 2000 <clears throat> with all those great artists involved. And just a few weeks later, <laughs> he took someone else's word that Paul was dead. And he That's was right. really involved in the in that whole thing that you know there's uh yeah. there is our air checks of Russ Gibb on the radio in Detroit talking all about that and uh and and that was real it's not exactly how it started. He didn't start it, but he sort of got it rolling in a big way that got picked up by everyone um so he was obviously an influential guy sitting there in Detroit hmm. Mm -hmm. And in two parts of Beatle history. Mm -hmm. DJs can be very influential. Well, I know of you course. are. Of course, we know that. Mm. <laughs> Everybody hangs on your word, Darren. So <laughs> with that in mind, what did you think of the way the story was told? I just want to start off by making a little maneuver here to show that I'm dressed for the occasion with my Ooh. Plastic Ono Band shirt. Look at you. Look at that. Okay. Um, I thought the... Um, I thought the documentary was a little choppy. I thought it was good. It was informative. Um, of course, we're coming at it from being very focused in on John and Yoko and the Plastic Ono Band's involvement and what it, it's a little place in history. It's more than a little place in history because it really was the, the, uh, the thing that was the impetus, you could say, to breaking up the Beatles. Lennon found that inner strength, that confidence. Uh, and he was, you know, evidently that close for a while to wanting to make the move. And, and this was it. Um, so you're, you're going to get that's really the basis of the documentary. If you're looking at it, generally speaking, as a documentary on the development of this festival, it is a, it does gloss over a lot of everybody else that was on the bill. This is really a film that's made for the John Lennon fan, the Beatle fan, first uh, and foremost. Um, uh, I thought it was, I would have liked to have found out a little more on 
really, even for the age, for the time, it seemed like an um, kind of an odd festival, an odd group of people. And it's interesting that we're talking 1969 and artists that were already being looked at as oldies acts. Uh, and today, um, this type of show would have been like a rock and roll revival thing happening in a supper club or in a, no, not a supper club, like in a dinner theater kind of environment. Uh, but here they were, all of these artists looking for a second wind in their careers. Some of them had it, some didn't, you know, and, uh, another influx of popularity. Um, all gathered and kind of out of left field. Oh, and here's Alice Cooper, who was generally unknown at the time and only one album out. Uh, this was when they were a band, Alice Cooper. I don't even know if um, uh, if Alice was calling himself Alice Cooper yet. Um, may have been. Uh, and also The Doors, just kind of of all the bands in Toronto, Canada, that you they someone would get to be on a, in a festival with these oldie, oldies acts, The Doors. Mm -hmm. Um, so it did seem a little bit of like, let's throw, see what, throw it up against the wall, see what it sticks. And I would have liked to have heard a little more on how all of that came together. And there were other acts being a huge Chicago fan. I would have liked to have known a little more on, um, Chicago, or they may have still been called the Chicago Transit Authority at that point, uh, on their involvement and their role. Um, in the festival, I'm sure there probably isn't any footage, but uh, but there were some pretty interesting things. I thought it was uh, fascinating that this festival's place in history. They didn't really mention Woodstock that often, but it was mentioned sort of in passing. It was thought maybe this could be the Toronto's Woodstock. Mm -hmm. Woodstock had happened less than a month earlier. It could have been, I think, to put its this festival's this concert's place in history into perspective. It's happening like three weeks after Woodstock. That really was glossed over. Uh, and also another thing they glossed over: the infamous arrest of Jim Morrison for indecent exposure. Did he or did he not? That had just happened, mm -hmm. and nearly got the doors knocked off the bill for the Toronto festival. But ultimately, it sounded like it was one of their first shows, if not the first show they did after Morrison, if that was behind um, Jim, um, who you see here, uh, I think, and, and I could be wrong with this. So this is September 69. So you're seeing really the first of, an, of a bloated Jim Morrison who has shaved and now you suddenly see where he's no longer that thin pinup rock star that he had been a couple of years earlier. Jim's put on weight and the beard's gone and you can really tell. Um, I don't think there's any footage of the doors. I would love to have seen a little bit. Um, but still, I mean, the dynamic of you've got Alice Cooper and Chicago and probably one or two others. We know that there were some local Canadian bands uh, or up-and-coming Canadian bands who are around um, because they point out that uh, some local musicians played in Chuck Berry's band. Chuck Berry didn't have a band. Chuck Berry, I guess, showed up alone. He needed a band. So there was this uh, local group, Nucleus, and I even found another band's name when doing some researching that's not meant, uh, research that's not meant uh, mentioned in the documentary, a band called Flapping. Uh, that was around, and some of the musicians were made up Chuck Berry's band. Chuck um, Berry just, always turned up without a band, I think. Uh, who I did? Mean, except maybe in his very early days. But uh, and in fact, I, I believe uh, one of Bruce Springsteen's early bands. It might have been Steel Mill backed Chuck Berry up for a concert. Um, you know, when they were still unknown. Okay. Yeah. So there was, there's a lot of moving parts to this festival, a lot of subplots that kind of are mentioned in passing and they move on. Of course, 
We're watch. We're watching it because we want the John and Yoko plastic ono band angle. But when it was over, I almost wished that this was a larger documentary that was able to dig into some of the other facets of this festival because it, it's 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 kind of a it's a weird festival. It's in Toronto. It's in on on a college campus in a stadium, not in a field like Woodstock was, not on a farm, I should say. It's one day. It's heavy on artists that have had their day eight, nine, ten years earlier with up and coming rock stars. It gets a beetle to appear mm -hmm. uh, at a time when, if you were a betting person, everyone would have bet against that ever happening. Um, and I, and I don't know the complete details, but I mean the Plastic Ono band almost appeared at Woodstock. Um, and that the thought had crossed Michael Lang's mind. Hmm, Beatles. And there had been talks between the Woodstock Ventures folks and Apple about possibly having a package of James Taylor, Billy Preston, maybe. Plastic Ono Band perform and maybe some art. And that all fell apart from what I gather when they got thrown out of Walt Hill, New York the Woodstock Festival just weeks before the event and they had to scramble to find a new venue and any talks with Apple with Lennon got ended up getting put on a back burner because they had nowhere to put the festival on. Uh, there was no mention of the fact that just weeks after that happens, here's this Canadian concert promoter or concert promoters who give it a shot, pick up the phone, let's call Apple. Oh, we got a Beatle. Hmm. So a lot more that could be dug into here. So this kind of skims the surface, but it does do a good job in doing a nice, clear overview of the Plastic Ono Band situation. Okay. You know, and I had for, for I forgot, and maybe I don't know how well this had been. I forgot how close John and Yoko came to backing out the day of their flight, which I'm assuming was the day before they performed uh, with the time changes. The John and Yoko were going to bail because I guess they were frightened. Well, they said they weren't feeling well, you know. Well, I'm you just know. saying what was covered yeah, in the yeah. documentary. And, and, of all, and of all people, they couldn't reach Clapton. But then Clapton, oh, he knew about it. He found out he's at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We better go over to the airport then. Um. And I also got the impression that there really wasn't much of a relationship, which I thought I had once years and years and years ago had heard about Alan White being referred to as a session drummer for Apple. But there didn't seem to be any connection to Apple. He was just a session drummer who was around London and, you know, and ended up talking to someone who knew someone who knew someone that linked up, you know, him to uh, John who needed a drummer. Uh, Alan White, but that part of it was uh, the, the actual Plastic Ono Band part of it is there's a nice, clear, succinct explanation about how the whole thing came about, how the Plastic Ono Band almost didn't happen. Um, almost nonchalantly, John's about to take the stage, and that's when he was sick and vomited off the side of the stage. Right. Which clarifies that because I always envisioned him having panic attacks like in a dressing room mm. long before they were to take the stage. No, this was as they're going up the stairs. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, let's go. Um, John does look, if you watch and, you know, and I want to dig out the D.A. Pennebaker film again, uh, wherever it is in my house, uh, but one of the older VHS releases to watch the performance because the little bit you see John really did look like he was very focused and at the same time terrified on stage. Hmm. He wasn't, you know, loose, smiling, relaxed. Um, and when Yoko goes in the bag and you actually do see the look on Eric Clapton and Klaus Vorman's face because they didn't expect that to happen. Uh, that's a, that's a very quiet, subtle, but very funny moment. Um, you see Yoko go in the bag, uh, I guess during cold uh, during give piece of chance. Um, Have I ever? And I thought she was in the bag for the, about this. I'm sorry. 
Have I ever mentioned here um, interviewing Clapton about this? Yes, I think you have. But tell us again. Well, I just said, you know, so at the at the end of that, when Yoko was doing, you know, doing her part of the set and you guys, you know, were just getting feedback and stuff. What did you make of that? And he sort of you know, was quiet for a few seconds. And then he just said. It wasn't my cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very brief clip of him. It looked like he was cleaning his guitar for it to be put away. But he's just, you know, rubbing something up and down on the fretboard just to yeah. juice yeah. up the feedback, uh, I guess, before he was going to walk off stage. It must have been a very crazy, exciting, exhilarating, bizarre, you know, way for this moment to end. And what what a moment it ended up being and what it meant. But, you know, the stuff that Alice Cooper was doing at that stage of, of their career hmm. um, was not a world apart from. No, from you're right. Yoko yeah. was doing those. I, I, it's a pity that um, that they didn't work out some sort of a collaboration there. That, that could have been interesting. I was thinking that, too. You know, they yeah. show at the end of Alice Cooper's performance that he throws these bags of feathers out into the audience. And it looks like it's snow falling. It's supposed to have that kind of an effect. And and John and Yoko are saying this is cool. <laughs> yeah. They're really you know digging what Alice Cooper's doing there. Um, but uh, there's a, a few things I wanted to touch upon that you said there, Darren. First of all, where Chuck Berry's concerned, he's known for going into towns and then just putting together these bands without okay. any rehearsal whatsoever. And I guess as long as you know most of his songs have the same chord progressions you know where to start once you know what key it's in and very often they didn't know what key the songs were going to be in they just had to follow chuck's cue and um but at the same time they found it really exciting to be on the same stage with with right. the legend yeah. Barry. and alice cooper one thing that um i wasn't aware of till i saw the documentary was that they had asked him to be gene vincent's backup band you know on the concert Oh, I forgot that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they uh, were. No, no, they were. Uh, yeah, they were the backup. I don't even know if I knew that. And if I did, it, I found I had. You know, we're talking years ago, and it completely slipped my mind. Um, so yeah, and that was another thing. It was kind of like mentioned, and they moved on. But I'm like, wait, hold, time out, pause. Mm -hmm. Alice Cooper back, Gene Vincent. I mean, like, huh? That's like. Kiss accompanying Liberace at a show. Right. Um, it, it right. just didn't. It well, <laughs> it um, it didn't register at first, and I'm like, this is a crazy scene that could never happen today, and really does beg further exploration, like maybe a book. So if somebody wants to write a book on something, uh, you know, to tell tell these little subplots and these other stories and the planning behind you know how are you let's do a rock and roll revival let's get jerry lee lewis and chuck berry and these these musicians who are still out there and they are still not too far removed from their success and they're putting out new music and but they're they're slipping off the off the main you know the mainstream radar so let's get them together and you know, end up with again Alice Cooper and and new acts that don't seem to jive. Well, I think in this in this documentary, Alice does a really good job of saying how much he revered a yeah. lot of these fifties rock and rollers. To him, this was like the hierarchy of rock. And even though I guess in in that time, ten years before, wasn't that long ago. I know we also live in a time where. You know, a song from two years ago is an oldie, but probably in in Alice's mind, he didn't think of them as just, you know, golden oldies. Mm -hmm. And um, they certainly zeroed in on an audience out there watching these 50s rockers and getting very much into it. Yes. So it's kind of shocking to me that tickets only sold once it was announced that John and Yoko were going to be there because this crowd did seem to like the 50s rock, too. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 there was I I enjoyed the reverence not only what um uh you know how the band Alice Cooper felt about it but the Doors too 
and mm. a very uh, a very sober and thoughtful Jim Morrison. They had audio of him right on stage speaking about what this moment meant, and. You know, I'm I'm a very big Doors fan, but I do not call myself an aficionado. I don't collect the live uh, recordings that have been coming out. I have a couple of them, but so I don't pretend to be a Doors expert when it comes goes beyond the basic albums and the music and the hits and whatnot. But I I I, I was taken very surprised to hearing a coherent Jim Morrison on stage waxing poetic about. His influences, I would have thought that the do- the Doors attitude would have been get grandpa off the stage. It's our time. Mm-hmm. But it was nothing like that. This was, you know, you know. Also, it's worth noting, uh, Robbie Krieger is interviewed in the documentary. And for anyone that's wondering, you don't see any footage of the Doors on stage from their uh, appearance. And Robbie says he's not sure what the reason is behind that, but he thinks it could be that Jim just didn't want to be filmed, which is really a shame. Well, I mean, just recently, since we passed the Woodstock anniversary, I was digging through some books and other things. And I'm always a little skeptical when I'm reading stuff because I'm wondering, gee, this person who wrote this in this particular book, how, how do I know that this is really factual? Let me go grab a couple. I've I've got a couple of dozen books on Woodstock and I'm, I can't find, you know, and then I'm like, you know, uh, what am I doing this for? Uh, but for my own information's sake, evidently the doors uh, um, were asked to be at Woodstock. Uh, I don't know if they committed, but Jim Morrison was afraid and, and, and concerned about playing outdoor festivals. He was uncomfortable with that, thought he would be assassinated. Uh, so we're talking again just a few few weeks earlier. Densmore and Krieger attended Woodstock. They were there as concert goers. Um, so that would fit with maybe Morrison not being comfortable with being filmed at an outdoor event. From what I read about the pop, the reason why the Doors may have backed away from Woodstock. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also. Uh, tell me what you guys think about this because I remember seeing Yoko walking on the stage and they said that she had the set list so they must have already determined what songs they were going to do but it almost sounded like Cold Turkey was like a spur of the moment thing like they didn't plan that they just went right into it did you get that impression? The film did give that impression, but I, I don't know how that could be since everyone knew the chords and, you know. Well, and- here, I'm looking it up, although you guys may know off the top of your head. I knew and just don't trust my memory. Um, was that the band? Was that the lineup that played on the studio version of Cold Turkey? No. Well, Clapton played on it, but Ringo was the drummer on Cold Turkey. Okay, so... Too, well, so Klaus they- Vorman, all right, it was, except for Alan White, replaced with Ringo on drums. Klaus Vorman did play bass. Right. And but Klaus... That was, but that the was studio later. That version... Was after of- the oh, wait, that's... A, no, wait. No, that's a studio version. The studio version has Ringo on drums. But right. the studio version, I believe, was recorded after they performed at this concert. Right, Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, let's see. That maybe clears that up for me. Um, you are you are correct, sir. Hmm. Yeah, see, I, I don't know what may, I'm getting my, I, you know, it's too much information. Now I know why Paul named an album Memory Almost Full. Now I'm getting yeah. it. Okay. Um, I, I always thought that, like, Cold Turkey was issued, uh, like, just after that performance in September, uh, when, according to this, they recorded it in a day at the end of September yeah, and and released it three weeks later as a single. So that was why uh, Klaus Vorman, in his the interview segment that they use in the film, acted surprised at this new song, Cold Turkey. I'm thinking, Klaus, you just played, played in the studio, didn't you? But they didn't. They recorded that after, see? 
That's why I do shows like this because it reminds me how much I forget. Mm. <laughs> it makes me John feel old. They proposed it as a Beatles single. Right. And they felt that it wasn't exactly the image they wanted to project, you know, singing about cold turkey. So um, mm -hmm. that also may have contributed to his feeling in the, the, about what he wanted his future to be. But Now, the other part of that, which really isn't, you hear about 10 seconds of uh, Don't Worry Kyoko, Mummy's Only Looking for Her Hand in the Snow which is the B side of the single. Um, according to this, that was recorded before they played it at the festival in early October. So that would have been something. Uh, yeah, was and Klaus was on bass and Eric was on guitar. The concert oh. was in September. September. What yeah. did I just say? Yeah, doesn't October come after September? Uh, not not in every country. Um, yeah, it was recorded October third. Okay, so it was after. I'm gonna the go lay. This is, I'm going to go lay down <laughs> over here and take a nap right now. This is just too much. Right. What? So a few days after Cold Turkey, they went back in the studio and recorded "Don't Worry, Kyoko." So that was another new one to Klaus on stage. What I thought was funny was um, when Klaus is talking about the rehearsal on the plane and saying, you know. Yoko came up and, and said, you know, well, can we rehearse my song now? And I, I just can't imagine what that rehearsal would have been like <laughs> if they have, you know, Alan White with just basically his drumsticks on the back of the seats, mm -hmm. John and Eric and Klaus with electric instruments and no amplification, just sort of, you know, strumming them. But Yoko would have been full volume. <laughs> On an airplane. Now, was that a private jet or was that a commercial flight? Because if it was a commercial flight, can you imagine being the passenger elsewhere in the plane? And Yoko starts singing and you think it's over. That's it. We're going down. Some, somebody knows something. Is that the pilot screaming? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting what you said, Alan, about what Eric Clapton said to you, that her music wasn't his cup of tea. Because here in this documentary, Klaus is really defending her, mm. saying what she was doing is really ahead of her time and relating to her, let's say, vocal improvisations, that she mm -hmm. was trying to convey the this feeling of the Vietnam War and the pain and the killing and all of that. And Klaus got it. And that was he, interesting. He thought that Yoko was way ahead of her time. So the, it's two very different points of view between Klaus and Eric. Mm -hmm. Yoko had already at that point in 1969, she had already collaborated, I guess, just in live performance with Orna Coleman. Yeah, I think. Yes. You know, so, I mean, people in the know in 69 probably weren't overly surprised when they heard Yoko a Yoko performance because she already had a little bit of a track record in, you know, free improvisational music and, um, you know, having worked with Ornette Coleman. I don't know how much they did together if it was one performance or if they crossed paths a number of times. It's interesting, you know, how the crowd received Yoko there because even for Cold Turkey, when they were done with Cold Turkey and Yoko was singing along with Cold Turkey, there was like silence at the end. And didn't John say something like, wake up, everybody, or, you know, <laughs> for Cold Turkey, for one of John's yeah. songs, yeah. you know? So, um, yeah, I'm sure it shocked a lot of people there in that audience what Yoko was doing. And to end the way they did with trying to get all that feedback by putting the guitar up against the, the amps and all yeah. that, end that way. They didn't mention that Mal Evans, at some point when it was decided, okay, that's enough feedback, Mal walked out on stage and just clicked all the amps off. Mm -hmm. And that's how it, the performance ended. You do see in the film, if you're watching, for a split second, Mal back by the amps before they started playing, Man. you know, you know, setting stuff up. Um, but evidently, they don't mention that in the film that Mal 
shut those amps down because everyone, including Yoko, I think, had left the stage, mm. which I think is a pretty electrifying way to end something like that, you know, with just feedback and the band is gone and what's going on here. And I'll tell Another you what, sort of interesting you. undercurrent in the film was D.A. Pennybaker, who, who uh, you know, filmed it um, and had filmed Mon Monterey but didn't film Woodstock, which may be why he wanted to do this one, um, because he sort of volunteered to do this and bring a crew. Um, and except for John's part, I don't think we've ever really, you know, like he, he, he didn't do a Monterey Woodstock type movie about this festival so far as I know. Um, but I'd really like to see some of the other sets. Yeah. You know, we saw a little bit of Chuck Berry. We saw a little Richard with his mirror coat, you know, um, that was sort of interesting. But, you know, just snippets of performances. And I, I, I'd really like to see more of these sets. Um, I believe the audio of Chuck Berry's has been released as as part of a, uh, you know, a comprehensive Chuck Berry release. It might have been on that, you know, Bear, um, bear something, yeah. like bear family label. I'm not sure what it was, but um, I, I think the Toronto performance is out. But I'd like to see Chicago's performance has been released. Uh, I guess it's safe to recall them all bootlegs many mm -hmm. times over has mm -hmm. come out over the years in different titles and different. Uh, I, I actually have never heard any of them. I would imagine they're all subpar uh, audio wise. You were what saying um, you did, whether they were called Chicago or, or still Chicago Transit. That would have been around the time they made the change or they just did change their yeah, name. because in the film, um, they show the tape boxes and the tape boxes say Chicago Transit Authority, but they also include Kim Fowley's introduction of them and he just says Chicago. Yeah, the first album came out in April 69 and it was they were still obviously because that's the name of the album the Chicago Transit Authority. I imagine not long, like maybe right away, as soon as the album's out, the real Chicago Transit Authority objected to the use of the name, uh, uh, forcing the band, which I think they were already being referred to as CTA in Chicago for short. Um, so that a couple of months later, it's funny that Columbia Records, I think it was a couple of months after the album came out when finally a single was released, question 67 and 68, the first single, and the single's credited to Chicago. Hmm. You know, and that's by, that's around this time, the very late summer, September or so, that single comes out, and it's a Chicago single. So I think by that point, they've officially, you know, shortened their name and the logo is about to be revamped and... Because then Chicago, the second album, is January 70. Mm -hmm. I got to wonder why Chicago is not mentioned in the actual documentary here. I didn't watch all the bonus features. Yeah. Yet. Come on, a major band like that? Well, is maybe at that, at that time, no, they weren't. Um, but, you know, and the, and the first album didn't jump out of the box and start selling in droves. Uh, it took a little time, so they still were rather up and coming. I, uh, in, in recently doing a lot of reading on Woodstock just a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I think I knew this, but again, forgot the details that they were going to play Woodstock. Uh, but they had a contract with Bill Graham, I believe, to play shows at the Fillmore West. Hmm. And Bill Graham could change the schedule as he needed and intentionally moved Chicago to play at the Fillmore West that weekend. Uh, and he did the same thing with... Uh, it's a beautiful day, I think. Hmm. Uh, oh, I think that because they were also supposed to be at Woodstock because Bill Graham wanted the slot for, his, for his, his, uh, one of his other babies, Santana. Uh, who were virtual, who were un completely unknown, um, at least in the Northeast, uh, in August '69. So he kind of sounded to me like Bill Graham sort of screwed Chicago 
so that they couldn't play Woodstock and for whatever reason, they're kind of buried under with Toronto too, but they were there evidently. No, not evidently. They were there. But even still, I'm not, I understand they weren't a big name yet, but because of what they became. Yeah. (laughs) Why aren't they in this document? I I don't know. Maybe, I mean, it could be a simple case of, you know, it was early in the show. They weren't filming. I, did, I thought there was a, a, a little clip of them playing in an interview with one of them. There was definitely footage of them. I remember that because I remember watching the guitarist. Hmm. Terry Kath. All right. I got to go back and watch. I, don't laugh. There was a, like a, like a maybe, like maybe 40 seconds that I dozed off. But I, the chances are that I missed Chicago in that. Perfect mm-hmm. moment, unless it's in the feature, the bonus features, which you, none of us watched yet. Um, but Danny Serafine, the drummer, is mentioned in the interview credits at the end uh, with special thanks because he was one of the people interviewed. You know, what we haven't made mention of yet that I think gave a very interesting perspective on the whole day was the uh, a lot of interview clips, a lot of interview segments with Getty Lee from Rush. Uh, I mean, they're from Toronto and, and and Getty Lee and his buddy, John Rutsey, the original Rush drummer, um, drop acid and they go to Toronto and they were having the time of their life walking around Varsity Sa- Stadium, seeing right. all these acts. And then here comes the Plastic Ono band. Um, so Getty Lee, who ends, ends up becoming enormously successful musician, came at it from someone in the audience, a kid in the audience point of view, witnessing and experiencing this whole thing, which also was a very important part of this documentary that he was able to give that perspective. <clears throat> yeah. Mm-hmm. About to say that. Also, I really think um, that Anthony Fawcett to be in that position, he was 20 years old. <laughs> 20 a kid you know working for john and yoko answering the phone on their behalf you know trying to communicate with them about this whole getting involved with this concert you know and he was with them on the plane right wasn't he with them all the way anthony fawcett yeah now anthony fawcett wasn't wasn't an apple guy correct he was john and yoko uh employee productions guy because he's he's you know he 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 wrote this very important book that came out so many years ago one day at a time yep yep and it came out in the 80s i believe did it not because it was one of my first beetle books not in the 70s was it i thought it was the 70s it could have been i maybe mine's a reprint um but i got yeah my, yeah it could have been tail end of the 70s and my cop maybe i bought it in the early 80s um <clears throat> his book is so important and I'm watching this going, you know, that book needs to be made available again. And I'm very surprised Anthony Foster saw has sort of slipped through the cracks. We don't hear more about him and more from him today. Uh, I didn't even know he was still alive mm-hmm. till I, till, you know, I watched the, this movie the other day. But there's a lot of, I mean, we 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 mentioned his book several times on this show, and that he's got the the um, transcript of chunks of the discussion at Apple, where John says, "I'm want a divorce, I'm leaving," and he there's audio. The, um, he has the meeting where they talk about how they're going to give uh, um, everyone for songs that he he has actually a lot of that and he must have the tape um because right, it's transcribed in the, the conversation right it's uh, it's really sort of um not verbatim but what he describes is so close to what's on the bit of tape that has got out that um you know obviously he either was there or has the tape and has listened and listened to it when he was writing the book. So it's, it's really very close. And it's uh, somehow, you know, until, until people began 
uh, talking about that tape, his his description of it had slipped under the the radar. You know, like no one, everyone must have read it when the book came out, and then just sort of it didn't grab anyone's attention until like twenty thirty years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I mean. That book needs to mm-hmm. come mm-hmm. out again. Yeah, hope I didn't need that. Yeah, he ought to do a, a new uh, a new edition with the complete transcript of that. Tape. Right, send us a, a CD inside so we can listen to it. I didn't say that out loud, did I? For On that, my wish list. It'll sell very well. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's not a perfect, it's, 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 a, it probably was a, it was a film that was made on, on a small budget. Uh, and they set about going into this film going, okay, um, we'll over, we'll overview the whole festival. But the main chunk of the story is going to be focusing on, John Yoko and the Plastic Ono Band, understandably. Uh, But unfortunately, there's so many sub-stories, subplots here that they briefly touch on and move on. It makes you almost want another film or or a book or some other chronicle of the entire festival and how it all came together, how, you know, it's Gene Vincent, it's it's, um, Chuck Berry and all these guys. Oh, Diddley. Oh, the Dillard, doors, Richard, yeah. Lewis, Lewis. I'd love to see Penny Baker's footage of all of that. I think, um, I think his his estate should um, work on that now. And his film, which was originally called, was that Sweet Toronto? Was that the name of his film? That was at least the name of um, one of the DVD issues of the Lennon section. I don't know if, right. it was, if that's what he was going to call the whole film. I don't know what you know. They they don't really talk about what happened and why the whole film didn't come out, and you know what what the deal was there. You know, when I watch the one to one concerts, I really want to see the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I want to see all the other acts from Shauna Na to R- Roberta Flack to Stevie Wonder to to John and Yoko and Elephant's Memory. I want to see all of that. That'd be nice to have that all in one package. Same thing with this. You know, there are a lot of lesser known acts that were part of the bill that are not discussed here. Maybe we don't need to see that, but certainly all these legends from the 50s and Alice Cooper and John and Yoko. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see the whole thing. It would be nice. And whatever the best quality is that you can make today. Yeah. that. So... And also, um, as we said earlier, this is such an important concert because it's what led to John leaving the Beatles. And I think maybe in part because of the fact that John went and did this so quickly, so spontaneously. On the one Mm -hmm. hand, he was nervous about it, but I'm sure at the same time he was really excited and exhilarated to do this and do this on his own without relying on the other Beatles to do it. So I think it's a very significant concert in that regard. And um, and you also notice from what um, Anthony Fawcett said and Klaus Vorman that John was really looking for a way out of the Beatles at the time, and he was very unhappy. So by doing this show, it gave him an outlet for that one moment there, and it made him realize he could do this on his own. So I think it's a very significant concert in that regard aside from the performance. There was one other nice little tidbit in the film where um, (laughs) Alan Klein says to, I guess it might've been to the people at Chum who called him and he said, no, John Lennon's not going, John Lennon doesn't do anything that I don't know about. (laughs) Oh yeah. yeah? Obviously he did. Uh, (laughs) Do we know... Um, and then maybe, I don't know, Alan, if any of this uh, crossed your path in preparing volume one of McCartney Legacy. Um, the other three Beatles, one, when they found out John's in Toronto playing this festival, their reaction, or when did they know? Did they even know it happened? I mean, I'm not sure how news traveled uh, at that time. 
um, within Apple. Is there any any record of the reaction of the other three Beatles to this? You know, I've never run into anything, but um, they must have known because, you know, he he would have he would have told people at Apple where he could be found if he, you know, was needed that weekend or, you know, whatever. Uh, I think he, I don't know. Well, you know, maybe not because if you remember in the film, they talk about how they get up and they decide they're not going to go. And then Eric's at the airport. So they say, well, maybe we should go. You know, it's very possible that he didn't call anyone at Apple and say, by the way, I'm going to be in Toronto this weekend. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I that's a really good question. I, I'd uh, maybe next time one of us runs into Chris O'Dell, we should ask her that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and, and also uh, what I what I was going again going back to uh, the possibility uh, of the plastic ono band being at Woodstock was that it, this said chris odell was the person at apple who was taking the calls from michael lang and having the discussion about apple sending over some sort of you know art installation which they were very much into and maybe even james taylor and billy preston is that what i said before uh, yeah, yeah. that they would perform and um so that be that okay well, this has been a great conversation about this uh, concert. And once again, it's called Revival 69. I advise, every, advise everyone to go check it out. And let us know what you think. So, Why am I backwards? Because you're the backwards traveler. Can you read that? Oh, anyway. <laughs> Why okay, yeah. I definite must, must watch. Uh, for Lennon aficionados and music historians also to, um, you know, fill, fill in a little piece of music history. Okay. Why don't we tell everyone what we're up to? Darren, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm up to here, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, you can listen to me on WFUV, and I hope you would. I wish you would. Oh, how I wish you would. Uh, I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights. We start at 10 p.m. We, me. I start at 10 p.m. We go to 2 in the morning. Again, me. And that's Monday through Thursday nights. No Friday night. Uh, and then on Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. Um, leading up to our program, Mixed Bag, that comes at 4 o'clock. Hosted by Don McGee. Of course, Mixed Bag, the program uh, that uh, was Pete Fornitale's. So I, I, I open up for Pete's show every Saturday um, from 1 to 4. WFUV is the radio station in New York City area, 90.7 FM. Uh, or you can just stream WFUV wherever you are at WFUV.org. And we have an app also. Download that to listen to us. Um, and if you want to shoot me an email at WFUV, by all means, by name spelled out. Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. But uh, let me mention that, uh, and I'll do this for you, Alan. Uh, this coming Sunday, I believe it is, Sunday. So if you're watching this show before September 1st, um, the old Facebook page is going to be wiped off the face of the earth Sunday. September 1st. Is that the September 1st to Sunday? Was that my, I think it is a Sunday. So please, if you are on our old page, and I've posted many reminders, if you are on our old Facebook page, please come to the new one so that we don't lose contact with you because uh, that, you know, older page is going to go. Um, and if you're new to this whole thing, join us at the at our page on Facebook, which is um, things we said today. How did I video. What, video podcast <laughs> things we are today? Video podcast. Do you know how I mean? I couldn't name it what I wanted to. I'm Facebook wasn't allowing me to pick this name or that name. So, uh, so that's that's that. That's them. Their apples. Okay, Alan. 
What have you got to tell the fine folks? Um, yeah, I'm um, not up to much, just hanging out, getting stuff ready for volume three, doing some reading again of volume two, because, you know, the process involves several editorial reads. Um, we've just been through the second. Um, but if you want to get in contact with me, I've got two Facebook pages Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. You can email me at alancozen at gmail.com. Um, and you can email all three of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We're big Gmail users here. <laughs> um, you can follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter uh, at things we said fab. And as Darren said, there is the Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast. <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard to remember. You know, in a year, we'll be just, it'll just be tripping off our tongues. Um, so anyway, that's that. Okay. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net on my YouTube channel. Ken Michaels Radio. I just did a really nice interview with a really nice guy named Brian Ray. This is the third time I've interviewed Brian. He talks about his new album called My Town. And actually, the album is kind of like a best of Brian Ray. There's 10 songs on there. Four of them are brand new. Six of them are previously released singles. And we talk about the songs on there and uh, ask a number of questions about his boss, uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of the show and so it's a delightful one hour conversation that you can catch at ken michaels radio there'll be some new interviews coming this week and next week so do make sure you go to my youtube channel and please subscribe ken michaels radio uh my other talk show podcast talk more talk a solo beatles video cast the next show that we're going to do which is next monday is going to be on the very same thing we've been talking about here and that's Revival 69, so we can get the perspective from Kid O'Toole, Joe Mayo, and Tom Hunyadi talking about uh, the new documentary. If you want to catch my radio program called Every Little Thing, the best way to do so is by going to the website of WFDU. That's Fairleigh Dickinson University's website, uh, WFDU.FM. And they post two weeks worth of shows in their archives. So each show runs for two weeks there. Just type in the words, every little thing amongst all the shows they have, and you can listen to it at your convenience. It's on demand at WFDU. And then again, there's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, where you can win Beatle prizes of all sorts, books, CDs, and DVDs with Beatles trivia every single week. Actually, there's a really good one that has to do with... Uh, Beatle and solo Beatle titles of songs. There's two titles there that start with the exact same words. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is right now. I'm going to sit right down and, and there's two songs that start with those words. And if you can name both of them, you could be a winner of one of the 10 prizes that are on my trivia page. Alan, don't give the answers away. <laughs> you know a lightning bolt right up here oh i know the answers okay but uh go to kenmichaelsradio.com for that and uh a big thank you to all of you for watching anything else you guys want to say no no not for me thank you for watching we'll see you in a couple of weeks yep. with a new show so for alan cozen darren devivo and myself ken michaels thanks to all of you for tuning in we will see you next time.